until death or the end of our story. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Cast of Kings, a decoding TV podcast about the HBO original series House of the Dragon. I'm David Chen, and I also like to spend a lot of time building up to things that don't happen. Joining me today, <laughs> she is the author of the unofficial guide to Game of Thrones, Kim Renfro. I was going to say this is, I'm Kim Renfro, and this is the first Game of Thrones related finale that made me say, huh, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, joining us also, she is the director of the Nebula film Identities and also the creator of the Jesse Gender YouTube channel, Jesse Earl. I do not podcast with any man who cannot best me, I guess in podcasting. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about season two, episode eight of House of the Dragon, the season finale. And we are going to start by talking about our overall thoughts on the episode. Kim Renfro. You said that you reacted to this episode by saying the word, huh? Or, no, no, huh. Huh, mm -hmm. that was your reaction. Yeah, huh, Ex period. <laughs> <laughs> e explain that. Explain that, Kim. What, what does that mean? Deconstruct the huh. I enjoyed many sections of this episode, for sure. I don't think that there was like a part of it that I strongly disliked. But I just found it to be a bit of a strange finale. It was like... Um, uh, both felt like too much was happening and not enough was happening. And it's rare that I feel that way about an episode of television where like, I, it just, yeah, it just read, it just read kind of strangely paced to me, not necessarily the episode itself, but as a finale at like, as the final buildup to what they're, they're sort of like leaving us with this season and I really just found myself wishing I could have been in the writer's room for understanding sort of like why they structured the season the way they did. Um, I thought like the final sequence was was cool, but and like, you know, a sweet buildup. But yeah, it, it almost felt to me like a mid-season finale of a show yeah. versus a season season finale of a show. I've so. been doing this podcast with Kim Renfro for probably over 30 hours now. And I think this is the least positive mm. I have heard you mm. on any episode mm. of this, uh, in terms of like reacting to an episode of the show. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, it's a weird one. Jesse Earl, what'd you think of this episode? I mean, I entirely agree. This, <laughs> the structure of this one is just strange to me because without spoiling too much, let's say I was aware of like these big events that are coming. And I, I was talking with my partner who's also read the book. I'm like, oh, they might do this in the finale. They might they do this? And we, we get like, it just seems like it's way more build up to get to stuff that'll be happening next season. And as a result, this episode just feels like, I don't know, it, it reminds me a little bit of... Uh, the Game of Thrones seasons where we would have something kind of huge happen in the penultimate episode. And then mm -hmm. the second, uh, the finale was always like sort of like a, a coming down action set up for the next season. Mm -hmm. But last week's episode, while the red sewing was cool, didn't feel like it was the, that felt like it was the big like, yeah, we're ready to go kick some butt at the end of that episode. And then it's still more build up. And yeah. so it feels like it just doesn't like, it doesn't pay off its great like uh like setup that it has mm -hmm. uh, it, honestly i would have rather last week's episode have been a, yeah. the finale and then like have this one be the startup for the new season or something absolutely. like that absolutely yeah so, yeah a absolutely that's that's you know jesse you weren't here last week but that's that's basically what i said i said mm. this feels like it could have been a good finale episode and i'm really worried that one of two <laughs> yeah. things is going to happen with the finale which is it's either going to one rush through a bunch of stuff super fast mm -hmm. or two and in a way that feels like we're in the middle of a story, like just abruptly yeah. ending. And yeah. uh, I do think that that I called it, guys, basically. You did. I called, I called you it. totally yeah. did. Because, yeah, I going into this season, I feel like I had kind of an idea of like all of the fire and blood events that they might try and pack in. And then, yeah, as, as the season was going on, and especially after last week's episode, I was sort of like, oh, I like it doesn't actually feel like they're building up to one more of those big yeah. book right. moments. There was... And either they're going to try and like speed through it, which could have yeah. like I I. Not to say that they couldn't have. Yeah, I'm that glad off. they didn't do that. I'm glad they did not speed through it for sure. Like, right, yeah. but it was just it was a strange mix of of storylines where I'm like, I feel like you might as well have just saved this for season yeah. three, yeah, and yeah. also like carryover of stuff that has been going on this season that did not feel like we got an end to the arc. It feels right. like they brought us. 
yeah, maybe eight tenths of the way through an arc. And so, yeah, again, <laughs> I was I was sitting here being like, huh, why was this season eight eight episodes instead of ten? But then a lot of the episodes this season were really long. So I just I have questions about what the conversations happening behind the scenes were to decide not only to do a shorter season but longer episodes and to include and not include what they did. Yeah, because there's there's again trying to stay spoiler free here like there's there's when i started the season i was like they probably are going to end on this thing i mm-hmm. think you'd probably know what it, i'm thinking of kim yeah and and the fact that they didn't get to because i was like oh they'll get to all these things they did most of it like the red sewing stuff like that and then i'm like they don't end on this thing that happens and it seems weird because i'm looking at season three and i'm like how is that going to be paced given right the rest of what happens right. after that it's, it's 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 a weird it's a weird choice it's a weird yeah. choice yeah i you know, there was a writers and actor strike that happened That's in true. the middle of the season of in the middle of production i believe Go yeah. ahead, oh, yeah, i was gonna say the actor strike did not affect it uh because uh, they're under different I, yeah yeah under because different i guilds. actually know this because uh, abigail thorne who's in this episode yeah. uh, i was filming my movie during the writer's strike or during the actor strike because we weren't affected by the sag stuff given our budget level but we almost didn't get abigail for because she was filming house of the dragon so i know for a fact the the sag strike did not affect the uh the actor strike for for house of the dragon yeah yeah right. no, that, and that then- i do know yeah go ahead kim I remember seeing questions raised about whether basically because I believe some of the writers might be in the Writers Guild, but because they were working in the UK at the time, like I remember seeing some discussion going on around like maybe it maybe it should have like maybe some of those strikes should have actually carried over into House of the Dragon, but they didn't. Yeah, I mean, there was also controversy around like, oh, the scripts are done. You know, so then like no right. additional writing needs to be done. But that's, like that's some people believe like show running is mm-hmm. uh, like writing is an essential part of show running. Yeah. Like stuff is decisions are made on the fly that constitute right. writing and so on and so forth. So I don't know if that impacted it. I, I will say looking at the season as a whole, it really does feel like seven should have been the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And like imagine if this was the premiere of the next season. Now, there have been weird things about that too like why are we yeah. spending so much time with Highland Lannister um but like this the end of this episode kind of tees up a really nice like oh stuff is going to happen after this you know and it would have been mm. like a nice like oh like and there is there is a there you know the the Damon stuff does conclude this episode so like yeah there, there is some some logic to it but um there's also just some very odd decisions that are made so uh uh, I, I kind of feel exactly like him. There's some stuff that's cool in this episode, but also just a very weird place to end. So, all right, let's get to the episode itself. First, we start with the opening credits of season two, episode eight, as usual. Um, and there's been a change, right? Kim Renfro, what's the change here? Yeah, the very end has an added little vignette of what seems to me to be all the dragons that we now know are sort of like on the board that have dragon riders. So there's like a big sort of sweeping shot that shows what is like Vagar, Aemon's dragon, facing off against the rest of the claimed dragons. So I'm pretty sure by my count, we got like Caraxes, who's Daemon's dragon, Vermax, Jace's dragon, Moondancer, Bela's dragon Cyrax which is Rhaenyra's dragon and then Sea Smoke, Silverwing and Vermithor who as we know were just recently claimed by Adam, Ulf and Hugh respectively. I also think that there might have been the extra dragon the one that Reyna finds in the Vale right. who in, in the show doesn't have a name yet. We believe this is a dragon from the books known as Sheep Stealer based on all of the you know, all all we know about this dragon is that he's he really likes eating sheep <laughs> in the veil. So I'm pretty sure that it's sheep stealing, yeah. but who knows yet. So yeah, this yeah. this new sort of dragon be dragon standoff now concludes the tapestry. I just want to give a shout out again to this opening credit sequence. Mm-hmm. I think it's just so cool. And uh Game of Thrones, the original, like that that is one of the great opening credit sequences of all time. And like, mm-hmm. it's 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 that opening credit sequence that is both cool to look at. And also helps tell you about the world of a show. Mm-hmm. And this opening credit sequence also somehow does the same thing. And so just shout out to all the people behind that. Uh, they did a great job this season. So, And it continues to change and evolve, which is wonderful. All right. The season two finale kicks off with Lord Tylan Lannister in Essos acting as an emissary on behalf of Prince Regent Aemond Targaryen. Um, Aemond asked Tylan to secure an alliance with the Triarchy. 
in order to help restore Rhaenyra and Corlys's blockade of ships. Uh, so, yeah, they want gold, and Tylan says that they can't afford to do that. Instead, he agrees to give them the Stepstones, that same patch of islands that Corlys and Damon once waged war over. Um, so, uh, there is. If, but first, Tylan has to convince the commander of the fleet, Admiral Lohar, to sail with him. Uh, the show has changed Lohar's gender in the books. The Admiral is a man, whereas here the character is played by Abigail Thorne. Full disclosure: uh, Abigail Thorne has worked with Jesse Earl on a yes. movie. Uh, so, <laughs> so cool. Uh, so yeah. Jesse might not necessarily be a hundred percent impartial here. <laughs> no, uh, I'm not. <laughs> I, I will say I, I thought Abigail Thorne was awesome in this episode. Like, just the, it brings a wonderful presence um, as this mm -hmm. character, Admiral Lohar. Um, I have to say, I was just not expecting any of this to be on screen. Like, is it, it, did any of you were any of you looking forward to how the, like is this, is this part of the books? Like, what's because it's like we have spent virtually no time with Tylan Lannister all season, so for him to be like a f a quarter of the episode was really shocking to me. Ken? Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting it at all, especially to like open the episode yeah, i was like i was like oh we're in essos okay cool oh we're doing triarchy stuff oh this is oh we keep coming back to this like <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was kind of surprised by it i did i like appreciated the humor in it i also think like Admir that abigail thorne is really cool as uh admiral lohar like I, I like this character a lot this was just one of those things where i was like this feels more to me like a story that you introduce earlier in the season like like this new character setting up like this dynamic between them um i appreciated all of it i just i kept being kind of surprised that yeah like you said that we were going back to it um so frequently but i did it was i, I thought it was fun seeing um this part of the world that george r. r martin has created i really loved like getting you see all like the tyroshis with like dyed blue hair that was a big thing in the books that's mentioned people uh who watch game of thrones will remember dario naharis who is eventually one of daenerys's like most loyal swords and and her lover etc cetera, etc cetera. in the books he's described as having this like brightly dyed blue beard and i remember it was kind of a thing when when game of thrones came out they were like oh they didn't even they just gave up on like the the sort of um more lavish aspects of this character by by making him just be like you know a, a hot brunette man not a dude with blue hair and like a forked beard um so it was kind of fun seeing house of the dragon be like no no we're we're gonna give you the full blue bearded guys and and yeah kind of all that world building aspect of it i really enjoyed jesse earl what are your thoughts on spending more time with Tyland lannister and admiral lohar this episode well, as you say, I'm not, I'm very biased. I know Abigail. She's great. She's a wonderful person. And I thought, I thought she killed it in this episode. I thought she was having a lot of fun playing this character. Um, she even told me a little bit about it when we spoke offhand. She's like, yeah, I enjoyed being really over the top with it. So she's, she was absolutely fantastic. Her smile at the end of that one, the first scene she introduced. Uh, oh, yeah. Like yeah. Perfection. Great smile and um, like teeth. I kept like, like, yeah, her mouth yeah. acting is so, <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> Just like shit eating grin throughout the uh -huh. whole time. It was great. Um, that said, I will say I do agree. I, do, I think it's weird. It kind of has the same flavor of like the the Corliss's bastard sons this mm -hmm. season where they just sort of like show up. It, it, it's a little bit more integrated than them because they seem a little they were even more sort of out of nowhere. Um, but it does sort of feel like, oh, we're doing this because they're setting up this character to be somewhat bigger later, um, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, so, well, they're introducing what seems to yes. be a major character yes. in the final episode of the show. It which is, is just, just a, a weird, weird decision. Placement. Yeah. yeah, it's a very weird placement, I think, on that part. That said, one other thing that I do want to talk about uh, that I thought was interesting was that we mentioned briefly that the character is a man in the books and that Abigail Thorne is a woman. Um, she's also very notably a trans woman and a trans advocate. And also, the episode episode refers to her like there are characters that refer to her as a man mm. in the episode as well mm. which is interesting to me too and, and like her character doesn't seem to have any issue with that either like it's not like they're like like she's rebuking that or like has an issue with that um and so it's just it made me think about like gender conceptualizations in different cultures because obviously we have the very gendered patriarchal vision uh within uh westeros and mm -hmm. essos may just have different ideas of gender so i, I think it's just i don't know there, we need to know more to really get a sense of mm -hmm. what the gender of this culture is but the idea of like 
Abigail Thorne is a woman, but she's also a trans woman in real life that we know her as in real life. But also the characters in the world refer to her as a man and she has a more feminine appearance, but she also has wives within the story. Like mm -hmm. there's just a lot happening here that's like, this is just an interesting, like this culture must have some different type of gender expectations, gender norms, uh, whatever. And so I, I, I found that to just be really kind of interesting and, and a good way to show a different culture with uh not just in the not just in the like oh look we play in the mud we're a bit more of a warrior culture but actually just in like the the base essentials of a society it was just yeah. really interesting yeah, yeah i love that yeah. like the, the idea that they don't have that they don't adhere to a gender binary mm -hmm. within the tairoshi group or within yeah. mirror yeah. at least and, and that this triarchy yeah it was just i found that to be kind of fascinating i i'm, I'm curious to see if I, I don't know if we'll explore that more because it seems like we're sailing away from there for now but <laughs> it was it, it was just an interesting concept that i was like oh that's kind of kind of cool i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well anyway uh admiral lohar challenges tyler lannister to a mud fight uh which apparently he bests her at mm -hmm. uh thus proving his worth there's a big celebration songs are sung bonds are tenuously made and then she says that uh, she wants him to have her children, uh, by which <laughs> she means, hey, can you have sex with my wives? And then he says, how many? And then we cut away before we even get to know how many it is. So uh, the one question I wanted to have answered, yeah, yeah, not addressed this episode. And he doesn't say no. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't say no. Cut to he's on the ship. You know, like next time we see him, he's on the ship. So you got to assume... A lot of stuff happened yeah. between those two scenes. I also love Lohar constantly calling him a different name. Like at first yes. she calls him Tywin, which I was like, oh, like we know within the world that Tywin yeah. is another Lannister name. But then she calls him like Tyrod, I think is like yes. another one. <laughs> yes. Yep. Real power move. Not, yeah. not lowering someone's mm -hmm. name. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts about uh, this whole Thailand Admiral Lohar plotline before we move on, because I don't think we're going to really talk about it anymore after mm. this. <laughs> a lot of mud. Uh, a lot of mud. No, yeah, it, also, looked, it looked uncomfortable to film. I will <laughs> yeah, say that. Right. I was like, not only are they really setting people on fire, like they really <laughs> flung those two actors into a giant pit of what looks like gross mud. I yeah. should. Ask, I'll, I'll text Abigail and ask her what she thought of the mud sequence, because I have to know now. I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> I have to confess, like, Kind of baffling, you know, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we're spending all this time with Tyler Lannister. We're introduced to a new character. Also, it's very funny. Like it's a very funny, yeah, almost tone. like slapstick. Yeah, yeah. It, it just feels like so, you know, it, again, it's a well executed sequence, but it's just like feels so out of place with like literally everything else we've seen this season. Um, so yeah. I also I thought of you because back in the small council scene when Amond made this request, your response to it was like, oh, they all just like did like the haha -ha anyways. Like, yeah, they're a good <laughs> idea, but we're not actually going to do that. And then like, they haven't mentioned it again since. <laughs> and then they jumped to this episode and it's like, oh, not only are they doing it, like they're doing they're it. They're really <laughs> doing it. This is, it because, because they could have just done it in one scene, but they're like, yeah. nope, this is going to be an actual subplot yeah. of the show. I, I guess just, um, I, you know, I guess this could, maybe be considered a spoiler you know so like but i i am curious like did it seems like the show is setting up tylan lannister to be a significant player uh, in the game of thrones here is that something that you expected in keeping with what you know of the book or is this just kind of like out of nowhere for you i would say more out of nowhere or just in terms <laughs> of like fire and blood like there are so many what i would call like more minor lords Mm -hmm. mentioned or like knights who like have miniature plot lines that intersect with what like the larger piece of what's going on and house of the dragon has largely like i think just by nature of the adaptation had to bring those characters into the fold a little bit more but no like in it's also maybe worth noting that in the book this isn't Eamon's idea to enlist the triarchy as an alliance it's actually otto hightower's idea when he's still hand of the king um, so yeah, not only like the fact that it's happening at this stage and that it's happening sort of under Prince Eamon's direction and the fact that like, we're seeing Thailand there in person, like all those things have been show inventions. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was surprising to me that we were spending that much time on the like alliance building piece of it, as opposed to just like 
the alliance has been made and now we're interacting with the triarchy again type of type of vibe so interesting all right well let's move on uh egon and laris talk about what's going on there egon and laris discuss his options now that aemond is fully on the warpath the master of whispers convinces the king to sneak out of king's landing and hide in bravos uh, this is something that you, you had kind of talked about in the bonus episode we recorded last week, Kim, of like, hey, the plan is we're going to get Aegon out of here. I got to say, my reaction to this scene was it feels like Laris's ideas are pretty far-fetched. That was my reaction was most of the time on this show, when a an heir or some royal person f- thinks like, oh, we're going to be welcomed as liberators, it, it never goes that way, you mm-hmm. know? Um, mm-hmm. And... Laris is painting this picture of we're going to go hide out. People are never going to hear your name for like a decade. And then you're going to come back and people are going to be like, oh, King Aegon. And I'm like, this is no way this is going to play out this way. Right. Like that was my reaction. And I'm, I was actually kind of surprised that Laris was even pro- proposing it because I actually thought Laris was smarter than that. Like that, mm-hmm. he, you know, it just seems like a bad plan to me. You guys already know how the plan ends. So like, I don't necessarily want you to comment on that. But like, uh, that was my reaction as a show watcher is. Bad plan. That said, any thoughts on this scene, uh, Kim? I thought you were going to say far-fetched in terms of like, like when he was like, Eamon's going to kill you. Not that I necessarily doubt that that might be something lurking in Eamon's mind, but it's not like we have seen any further threat to Aegon at this point, you know? Like, no, I, I, that, that part I bought, because I, I feel like Eamon Ag- would kill Aegon at the earliest opportunity that he has. That's kind of my... Sense yeah, but I'm also like he did why? press that marble ball into his chest real hard <laughs> sure. that one time. <laughs> but like he hasn't threatened him since that we like you know like right. I I I guess I kind of was like either wanting one more scene of Aemon and like Aemon didn't even say anything about Egg on this whole episode, which I also thought was like interesting. Like mm-hmm. he's very focused on ruling right now. He's and, very focused on massacring innocent civilians. Yeah. And ruling, you know, in Aegon's place. So yeah. And bullying Aegon's wife, AKA both their sister. Uh, but yeah, I just, <laughs> that, that part I was sort of like, yeah, Laris sort of seemed to me to kind of go from zero to a hundred of like, Oh, mm-hmm. there's, I, he he seemed to be yeah. acting out of an urgency that I didn't necessarily understand yeah. where it was coming from all of a sudden. At like yeah. so that was sort of like the part. And yeah, like I think that Laris's plan of just keeping him alive is a good one. Like I understood <laughs> sure. that. Sure. Right? If, if that's the end goal, right. then but yes, like, definitely get out of there. But the like, future projection of yeah. like you're gonna come back. You're and... gonna come back, you'll be greeted as liberate. It's like, no way, dude. Like and and, and I actually lost respect for you, Laris. Like that I mean, you thought he, that this would be a good idea, you know? Toss anyway. my two cents. I will, yeah. uh, just to make it work a little bit in my mind, is uh, not that I necessarily disagree, but Laris is very clearly on the downswing in terms of his popularity with Aemon. <laughs> like, Aemon does not like the guy. Yeah. And so I could see yeah. Laris not only having a, a uh, you know, feeling of companionship with Aegon in the sense that, like, oh, he's also dealing with some form of disability like I am, um, but also being like, well, if I get in with Aegon, and he ends up being the winner of this whole thing, then, you know, my stars, like, I'm going to do great. Um, and so maybe this is, like, his idea of, like, this is the one play I have. Because mm-hmm. if I stay here, I'm I'm not going to I'm not gonna be good with Aemond. And if I wait for Rhaenyra to win, then I will also be, like, screwed because I killed her husband. Um, so this is my literal only play. And so, yes, it's not a smart plan necessarily, but it is his best shot to kind of come out on top. On that note... I know Egon spends some part of the scene talking about how his uh, penis has been destroyed in the, uh, <laughs> in the fire. Talking about coming out on top. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am curious, put, you know, putting aside that he no longer has like functioning genitalia, I'm curious if you all had any vibes you're picking up between the, the Egon and Laris situation. Like, if there is any kind of. Is it just kind of, um, <laughs> hey, uh, subject to king relationship? Is it, uh, I, I'm looking for a companion, you know? Like, is it, I'm looking mm. for something more than a companion? Like, it felt like, is there something more here than just, I'm the king's are you, subject Are you a Laris and Aegon shipper? Are you a... <laughs> a Lagon? A, a, a Lagon? Lagon. Lagon. Yeah, there we go. 
Eris, Lego. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that I'm a shipper. I'm just curious if any of you picked up on anything, or if no. I was, you know, no. Okay, I'm, no, none of you I'm picked up on it. anything. I'm calling it. You're a shipper. You're you're, you're <laughs> shipping them, David. Okay, all right, all right, fine. Okay, apparently. <laughs> Apparently, no, it's a I, very outrageous thing to suggest. So, sorry for suggesting that these two <laughs> men might desire each other's company in any way beyond I, king and subject. All right? I love it. I just, <laughs> I, my brain didn't go there. You, you didn't I go was there. I okay, focused on Rainier and Alice in this episode. Okay? Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. have any time for Legon. Uh, <laughs> I just. <laughs> It just uh, Dave is just writing it up all night, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, put your hand Larry on me. Gone. I'll help. I'll help you walk. And <laughs> <laughs> anyways, uh, anyway, but yeah, no, I I actually didn't see that either. But now that you say it, like I could see it. But I think it's just well, okay, like okay. Let, let, La- let me just say one thing, and then I yeah. want to hear your reaction, Jesse. Yeah. Which is like the the way the reason I bring it up is because Laris was like the way he described. He was like painting a picture of their future life together. He's like, mm. we're gonna run away, and then we're gonna hide out. For years and years, just us two alone together. And then we're going to come back and people are going to celebrate us. And he says us. He's like, they're going to celebrate us. You know, we're going to be. In, in, and so I'm like, huh, that's a little. Huh, I wonder what's what's going on there. OK. All right. Uh, that's the last I'll say of it. Jesse, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I definitely you could read that in there. I, I think the us part was like him trying to like make combine the like your success is like for both of us to like, again, kind of going back to that idea of the plan of this is the only way I can get out on top. And if I ingratiate myself with him so hard, uh, then he will he will want to give me, you know, some recompense when we get back and we're all we're all winners here. So like, I, I think that that's all part of it. Now, that being said, I'm certainly I don't think there would uh, Laris would necessarily be against using romance as part of it, but I don't think Aegon necessarily would uh, be into it. I think it more, I think the element of it that kind of comes into close to that, I think, is Laris earnestly identifying with Aegon having a disability. Like, I do think that Laris mm-hmm. is making a play here. Like, it is a calculated political play he's making, but I don't think he is necessarily lying about his relating to what Aegon is going. Through. That's fair. So mm-hmm, I think that yeah. that element is is earnest, which is the first time we've ever seen Laris be earnest, which might end up coming into some romantic feelings in terms of his political posture that he's doing. Yeah, not even I don't want to be reductive. I'm not even necessarily saying romantic, you know, but just like friend, even f- friend bromance, you know, friendship, yeah, yeah. you know, platonic friendship feelings, you know. It well, you feels your one-sided pick. to me. <laughs> this is a one-sided a one-sided Legon situation because <laughs> I feel like Egon went along with it. In the end, he seemed most yes. enticed by that pitch of like that he might be able to win back the hearts of the people. If right. we go all the way back to like the season one finale, Aegon really didn't want to be king, and he seemed to only get a get a satisfying taste for it when he, you know, like raised the sword over his head and saw how people were cheering for him. Like that seemed to be his sort of like, oh, okay, like being king might be actually pretty cool. Um I thought it was interesting that he uses the phrase the realm's delight to like describe this future right. iteration of himself. In the books, that is the that is the label that was given to Rhaenyra when she was Princess Rhaenyra, is that she was known as the mm. realm's delight. And like, even though she was an heir, that she was very beloved by all the people and the lords and ladies of King's Landing. And so an interesting parallel again that they're trying to draw, I think, between Aegon and his half sister and the different ways in which they try or don't try to win the hearts of the small folk. So, yeah, I don't know, but I, I truly don't know that I can unhear uh, it burst in the flames like a sausage on the spit. <laughs> on a spit. <laughs> yeah, it was very evocative. Yeah. I was like, oh, damn, damn, dude. Also, they mentioned Sunfire being dead again, which I just every time they do that, I keep wanting to be like, he's not dead I- in the books. Poor Sunfire. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And look, I don't mean to make light of uh, this person's uh, disfigurement or anything like that, but I do think it was meant to be somewhat comical the way he kept focusing on his penis while Laris was trying to talk about other stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> like Laris is like, okay, so here's the plan. We're going to whisk you away in the middle of the night. And he's like, I can't even pee, you know, without yeah. it running down my leg anymore. And it's like, oh, okay. Like that's uh, th- basically the show doesn't really have that much humor in it so i feel whenever it does have humor i feel the necessity to point it out so Mm -hmm. all right anyway uh that's some of the stuff that happens with (laughs) Egon and laris this episode aemond spends this episode trying and failing to convince helena to fly her dragon dreamfire into battle 
First, he physically attacks her, trying to literally pull her into the conflict with him. Later, he tries a softer, middle-of-the-night conversational approach, but Helena just hits him with the doom-laden prophecy talk. That old chestnut. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let's talk about all this. First of all, like the, the scene when he originally convinces her, like uh, I actually thought that was a great scene, right? And Allison intervenes and... Uh, and he kind of puts the question of, hey, like, do you do you want us to die or do you like, should we win? Uh, don't you want us to win at any cost? And she says, not like this. She like is declaring like this is the line that she's drawing. Not no farther than this. Uh, great sequence of just two. Uh, you know, Helena, the woman who plays Helena is also very, very great. But like, I think Allison and um, Amon uh, here. Yeah. Sorry, just getting the names right. Uh, Allison to Amon really like just going at it and uh at the top of their game here i thought uh really really wonderful sequence yeah, but, yeah. it was it was, it felt really heartbreaking to me for like certainly for helena but for the whole like just like seeing that like the whole family is like s- at such blows with one another and given that Aegon is where he is and aim it like just yeah a lot of tragedy layered into everything also the when helena says like you know i was happier before i was queen and Allison doesn't really respond to that in itself, but I was in my head. I was like, "Yeah, so was Allison. Like, you know, she was made to be queen at a very young age as well." And I think that that's probably where her head's at a bit towards the end of the episode too, of being like, "Huh, like I never really had the chance to be anything other than this uh, this figurehead." And then at times she she felt like she had power, but yeah, the the way that she she really insists like. Like, basically, it seems like by the end of the episode, we get the sense that she's okay. She's okay with Aegon dying to put a step, to put an end to this. But, like, Helena is really where she draws a very clear line of being like, that mm-hmm. is that is too far into the realm of, like, destruction for me to tolerate any further. You're taking someone who's innocent uh, and, and kind of corrupting them basically like forcing them to murder people you know and and she's like i cannot stomach that what's the point of continuing if that's what's required to continue right Mm -hmm. uh anyway jesse any thoughts i mean no you basically said the thing that i was gonna say i really did like this tearing apart of the family bit that we got here Uh, we haven't had a ton of interaction between these two especially this season and i i did like his speech in the second scene of like trying to convince her and trying to talk to her outside of um allison being there and like have painting this very poetic picture of their family together and helena just sort of shoving that away um and, and it was we, we bring up the prophecy part of it that we'll talk about in a second here where there's uh like an element of like helena sort of seeing ahead but uh the last line where she says or where Aegon, or sorry Aemond says i could have you killed and she says it wouldn't change anything mm-hmm. there's an interesting double meaning there where like one it wouldn't change anything given she it's a prophecy so like she she knows that it wouldn't change anything either way but also just sort of like her insignificance too mm. in an in interesting way of just mm. how much she feels like she doesn't matter in in a weird way I, it was just it was it was just an interesting inner in, insight into how Helena sees herself in all of this and just how small mm-hmm. she kind of feels in some ways. And yet she stands up for who she is and saying, I'm not going to kill people. I just, I really liked, I, I liked all of this stuff. It gave me a really good characterization of her. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that. She makes this prophecy saying, Aegon will be king again. He's yet to see victory. He sits on a wooden throne and you, you'll be dead. You were swallowed up in the God's eye and you were never seen again. End quote. So, uh, Kim, what's the God's Eye? The God's Eye is the lake that is right outside of Harrenhal. They actually cut to it right after this scene. Um, that's that's where we see Rhaenyra and Adam flying with their dragons towards Harrenhal. They fly right over the God's Eye. So it's this big lake, um, again, right outside of where the big castle Harrenhal was built. And there's an island in the middle of it, so it looks from like an aerial view it looks like an eye which is part of why they call it that and then the island in the middle of it has a ton of weirwood trees on it and so it's sort of like known as the hub of a lot of magical ancient goings on in Westeros um and we can talk about this or we will talk about this a little bit more once we talk about Damon and Harrenhal but the like the god's eye in that island particularly is where 
a group of people known as like the green men are said to have once lived and the green men one of like part of like their legend is that they take care of the weirwood groves and that they again have like this connection to to the magical aspects of the land and that they wear like antler helms and so when damon sees that like random figure right next to the weirwood in heron hall and then it seems to disappear i'm pretty sure that that was meant to be a green man and again like the green men are connected to the god's eye so like they were doing a lot to kind of link those magical aspects of the story not only you know really going into it with damon in this episode but we see that helena seems to also have a very strong connection to this like green seeing or like dragon dreamer aspect of the story um and she's kind of giving Eamon a big warning here about his future. And it's not not looking great. <laughs> Assuming everything Helena says is true as a show watcher, I'm just trying to piece together like how this all comes together. And I so probably Eamon dies in some dragon battle over that lake is my guess. And then Aegon is cr- a king again, but he's not going to be king on the Iron Throne because he's sitting on a wooden throne. So... Maybe he's king in a mini kingdom far away, or maybe he rules by proxy or something. You know, that's what's that's what's running through my head. Again, not expecting you, you to comment because you already know what happens, but I'm just saying, like, those are my guess. That's just kind of what comes to my mind. Um, he's yet to see victory. I, I think that means like he is going to see victory at some point, as yet to be determined. That's my mm-hmm. interpretation of what she's saying there. So it's also anyway. interesting that like this. I feel like her all most of her previous sort of like prophecy statements have been i want to say either in the present or future tense it's funny that this one's a mix of past and present tenses like how sushi she says like Aegon will be king but then she tells aemon you were swallowed up in the god's eye as if it's already happened um which again is just really fascinating especially the fact that right this prophecy is linked to daemon and that like helena seemed to like almost physically be in like the same void as him and it's almost like she's sort of like losing sometimes losing her place of like where right. she is in the timeline kind of kind of vibe yeah. which yeah the tense the tenses change is interesting yeah like what is, yeah. does that mean anything right yeah yeah and i i the, it reminds me too of something a, a discussion that i saw after like the blood and cheese incident which a lot of people were talking about sort of like her helena's reaction in that moment and how she sort of seemed like frozen up and sort of just went through with it and then almost in a daze kind of like ran to her mom's room. And I saw someone pointed out like if she has dreamed of this happening before, like if she's had sort of one of those prophetic visions, it's almost trippy to think of like as it's finally happening to her, her like not realizing that, oh, it's real this time versus like I'm not just dreaming about it and sort of having that be tied into how she was physically responding and kind of like, being like, oh my god, like, oh, this is this is the time, like, this is really how it's unfolding, and sort of how disorienting that would be for someone like her if she's kind of constantly flipping between dreams and futures and prophecies and yeah. and all that jazz. There are a few miscellaneous scenes for both Team Green and Team Black. First, let's talk about the small confrontation between Kristen Cole and Gwen Hightower, Allison's brother. He seems to have finally decided to call out the King's Guard Knight for sleeping with his sister, but Cole has sunk into full nihilism and doesn't try to defend his actions beyond explaining how he has been devoted to Allison ever since she saved his life. Okay, um, folks, here is where the weirdness really kind of started for this episode. Is like <laughs> it really felt like there was like a whole deleted scene or you know episode that had some scene between these two characters. Um, because it, it, I think it opens with, he's holding, he's sniffing Allison's handkerchief. Like, yeah, her favor that he had yeah, her fa- and then And then literally like, that's when Gwen comes in and is like, Hey, um, I'm going to hold a knife or a sword at your throat. And it's just like, what is yeah. going yeah. on here? Well, like, why was, are we, like, was this in- supposed to be earlier in the season somehow, but they like. Right. Cut, why are we cut and paste it into the finale for some reason? Why are we intercepting these characters at this moment? It just because mm-hmm. it's, it's not there's no build up for this comment. It's not like earlier in the season he's like, "Hey, I really don't think you should be sleeping. Who are you sleeping with?" You know, it, it, well, the second I find any evidence that you're sleeping with someone, I'm gonna freak <laughs> out. You know, like nothing. And it's just yeah. all of a sudden they're. It's just it was weird. Yeah. It made it added to how disjointed the episode felt. Anyway, Jesse, what would you think? 
I mean, I just really feel like it's a scene that they felt they should add to add some sort of conclusion to Cole in the finale. Mm. It's like, oh, we need to st- have something with Cole. So we need to have this sort of like big speech where he talks about death and being relieved right. and like give some sort of resolution to his character arc. And the only way they came to think of it was like, oh, let's add in some sort some of conflict. conflict. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. conflict in there with Gwen. So yeah, it, it really just feels like a kind of forced conflict moment to just have some sort of thematic resolution with Cole. Yeah. 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 I-, I totally agree. And like I said it felt like it was almost written for an earlier episode but for some reason they decided to plant it here and I just don't think that that was necessary like I think that they could have just not shown us Cole or Gwen in the finale and I don't think anyone would have really questioned that given that like we knew they were riding off with the armies it's not like we there was a specific reason we needed to see their armies in this episode I buy that this conversation might have like happened at some point or needed to happen but yeah it really felt bridged by nothing and yeah, i was like gwayne yeah. gwayne like gwayne watched him get her favor early like way earlier in the season right. like the first time that they rode out together and yeah i agree and plus like the way that, like the other soldiers were like watching them as if like yeah. a big fight was gonna break out and i was like i don't understand where any of this tension came right. and then the tension vanished by yeah. the end of the season, by the end of the scene, yeah, there was more tension in the beginning of the season when they first met. Like they right. kind of didn't like each other, and that seemed to not be coming back up throughout the rest of it. I did like Kristen Cole's speech, though. That was a good right. speech. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's good like, lines. Hey, death, death will be kind of a relief, you know. So, yeah, like hey. I, I, I still, I still hate the guy, <laughs> but I do appreciate that. Like, there's, I think that he's more interesting to watch grappling with his morals or his lack of any philosophy post Rook's rest battle, because it right. makes sense to yeah. me that seeing something like that would seriously change a man. But yeah, it was just a really weird vehicle in which to deliver. So yeah. it just, He's just, it going just added to this whole, like okay, just one of these elements would be fine, but like, you have the Tylen Lannister bit, which is like, why are I didn't know we were going to be doing <laughs> yeah. that. And then like, you have this like out of nowhere scene with Kristen and Gwen. And I'm just like, it just added to like a very disorienting experience watching this episode of like, why are we doing anything that we're doing and where are we and so on. So, yeah, anyway. I, I will say his speech was interesting in the sense of like the nihilism he's feeling in the existential crisis. So like, oh, we're all meaningless. And because he has no philosophy, he's just sort of it, it added to that incel vibe that he, <laughs> he kind of gives off of like nothing. Everything's meaningless and everything. I hate everything. Sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And the, I guess there it's also interesting to see the contrast of how he talks about his affair with Allison versus how mm-hmm. Allison talks about it later. Like, mm-hmm. like he just seems to think that like, Oh, I was loyal to her. Not like I loved her. Not I, I too desire women like type thing. It, uh, yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Um. Well, anyway, <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what else. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good, good explanation. Yeah, of that. Yeah. Well, anyway. I don't know what else to say about that. Reyna wanders the veil with no, <laughs> no food or water, sleeping oh under gosh. rocks. She comes face to face with Sheep Stealer in a cliffhanger scene. Sheep Stealer is the name of the dragon in the book. Yeah. Um, they uh, really this... stretch this thing out, man. I they know. Really, they really stretch this out over like four episodes, basically. Um, but I just found it fascinating that every time we just cut back to her, I'm like, oh, she's just wandering more. She's just wandering. She's just she's just she's just wandering okay. a little bit more. To, in in the show's defense, which is not something I'm going to say very often this episode, um, uh, it does look like they actually had the actor out there in the middle of the wilderness. Oh, yeah. it, it looks, looks amazing. Like, it looks just, oh, it looked great. I just yeah. every time we cut to it, I just was like, oh, okay, another minute of her just <laughs> wandering aimlessly <laughs> through, through through the mountains. You know, it, right. it just it feels like they shot all this in like a day, basically, because yeah. like. Um, I, I, Jesse, we were talking last week about how the scene where she wanders off from the convoy is like comically bad, in my opinion. She's oh, just yeah, gonna, like, really, she's just gonna like behind, and it's like, oh, I'm gonna escape now. It's like, okay, literally everyone can see you. <laughs> like you're not fooling anyone. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it feels like they're like, okay, they're in the writers' room. They're like, okay, we got to figure out a way to get her away from the convoy, and and you have six hours to shoot it. And it's like, okay, well, I guess she's just gonna wander off, you know? And it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Now, th- this stuff is kind of cool. Like her being in the wilderness, it's like, oh, I-, I can imagine that that would be extremely uncomfortable. And I do think they convey that a little bit. But from a from a storytelling perspective, this is pretty 
pretty rough stuff, I think. Um, yeah. Kim, any yeah. thoughts? I would, I would, add, I would take. Well, so the the Gwen Cole scene, I think maybe belonged in this season somewhere, but like felt out of place in this episode in particular. And then the Reina stuff, I feel like maybe similarly, like could have just been condensed into like one sequence earlier in the season and or just save it for next season. Like I, again, like, yeah, similarly, like we kept cutting back to her and I kept being like, why do they keep cutting away before she actually finds the dragon? And then, (laughs) <laughs> the fact that she finally found the dragon and then nothing actually happens between them in this episode. Like they're saving that for season three. I'm like, why not just save all of this for season three and have the I, last thing we saw from her in this season be that she is in the veil somewhere trying to find the dragon. It just, it was a weird, like both too much and not enough going I, on. I think it's trying to end like they, they kind of I think had in mind the end like the ending montage basically which we'll talk about. Right. But like they had in mind the ending montage of like every one of these characters needs to have some kind of decisive thing happen at this ending montage and that's how we're going to end the season and they kind of backed out from that of like okay well if Reyna is going to be meeting this dragon at the very end then we need to like seed that in right. in painstakingly small chunks over the course of the last yeah, four yeah. episodes right? Yeah, but um, I I just I think that even that decision that she needed to be in the montage, I don't quite Right. That's get. right. That's I agree with that. I agree with that. And, and yeah, it's like Raina's whole plot could have taken place in like 20 minutes in like one episode this season. Yeah. So it's like but they they clearly wanted to stretch it out so that she's kind of part of this montage at the end. So yeah. whether you agree with it or not is one thing, but I think that's kind of why they they did it that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, the shot at the end when she finds the dragon is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So there's that. All right. <laughs> then there's the scene between Corliss and Alan. The father and son finally come to emotional blows as Alan explains his reluctance to serve as first mate uh, and how it's rooted in resentment over Corliss abandoning him as a child. Again, this is another scene where it's like, oh, great speech. Great. A lot of great monologues this episode. A lot of great yeah. soliloquies this episode. Yeah. Um, none of which I felt like we like gave me particularly emotional catharsis, you know? Uh, it wasn't like I was thinking to myself, man, how is Alan going to resolve his deep seated, ch- you know, childhood <laughs> trauma with his father this season? Right? Like that's not what I was expecting. And, and the fact that we got it is like nice, but it's not like something I was expecting, but Hey, it's a nice, nice piece of, uh, of monologuing and a, a good speech. Well, del- like just great speeches. Well delivered this episode that I didn't feel like I was looking for, but yeah. A- a- any of you did this, move you at all like any any thoughts i actually thought it was a really great monologue and felt like a great payoff to their storyline this season but yeah i agree it, it felt like it could have come earlier and b it's these characters were so sidelined for so long and now we're just seeing them come together like we got um adam of hull like getting a dragon last episode and now this sort of the payoff here it just it just feels weird that's like oh these feel like good satisfactory endings to these characters it just was weird getting there um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But I, I think it's a, the monologue is fantastic, as you said. So I think when I watch the scene, I'm like, what is the show trying to do with these characters? Like, a- am I supposed to invest in Alan as a character? Like, it, 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 do, uh, do I expect Alan to show up again next season? You know, like what? That's that's the emotion I'm left with is like confusion about what the show is trying to do with these characters. Are they are we, hmm. are they like major characters that we're supposed to really invest? You know, I don't know. Unclear even as of this point. Yeah, Uh, but great speech. Great speech. Yeah, this was just this was another one that I feel like could have just been cut and paste into like last week's episode, Mm -hmm. and it would have been fine, and it would have helped. Would have felt more relevant last week's episode too. Right, like Corliss goes and talks to him about trying to like be a dragon rider, and they could have just extended out that scene and conversation and had that like build into this idea of like, no, not only do I not want to be a dragon rider, like I don't want anything from you you deadbeat dad but like uh, yeah like well written great performances but like it was just one of those scenes where i i just wondered why why now like why at this Mm -hmm. point and again like it's connected to that final montage we have them both like kind of like staring at each other in like this like awkward stony silence as they sail to the ship but like i think you could have still had that as a montage if you didn't insert this scene right here i don't Mm. yeah i don't know it was just it was just one of 
as we've said, a few a few bits and right. bobs here where I was they like, wanted huh. all these char- they wanted all the major characters to have some kind of big moment this episode. That that was right. their kind of replacement for having some big battle scene. It's like everyone gets some kind of emotional moment, and I just don't know that there was enough kind of build up for us to this to make us really uh, care about the fate of these two characters and their relationship to each other. But maybe maybe for those of you listening or watching, you do feel that way, and that's great. Um, uh, that's just kind of my reaction to it. All right. Rhaenyra and Jace need to contend with the new dragon riders in their retinue and test whether or not to trust the strangers. Uh, Corliss advises his queen to strike quickly and press her advantage now that she has six additional dragons. Uh, there's a scene where Jace confronts Hugh and Ulf in the war room. All right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about Ulf. In this episode, the idea is Ulf like doesn't know how to behave correctly, and it's haha fish out of water stuff. Uh, I found this like just at the edge of my believability because on mm. the one hand, yes, Ulf is clearly from a different background, and also he's in a situation where they need him theoretically more than he needs them, and so you can understand him like flexing in the way that he does a little bit. Um. And it is funny to see all these characters a little flustered by this guy who's acting weird, but I don't know. Uh, Jesse, what do you think of the Ulf dynamic? It's just weird because it makes me not track Ulf as a character super well because mm. Ulf, is, this whole season, has sort of been like, yeah, I'm descended from this guy, this king. He's sort of like this bragging sort of drunkard guy. And I get him being a little bit weird, but it's one of those things where it, it came across that he kind of wanted to be be uh, like a highborn guy like he right. was a lowborn guy who wanted to be highborn so it's weird to me that he has this sense of disrespect the right. entire time like there would have been different if they had played it where it was like he's attempting to be a highborn and he's really bad at it and yeah like he's knows. blundering he's yeah. blundering and stuff but but that's not how they play it they play yeah it like, he just plays he like, just he just thinks like fuck these people is kind of like his attitude. yeah which right. feels yeah. weird because like it's like that's not it's not what you seem to be giving off the rest of the season. So right. it, was just a, it made me track him a little bit weird. So Yeah, Kim, yeah. what did you think? Yeah, I did not like the entitlement <laughs> aspect <laughs> of his character. Right. Like, I could understand the doofiness a little bit. Um, it was kind of fun watching Jace, like, have an aneurysm, trying to, like, <laughs> yes. like assert himself. Um and I liked the contrast between Hugh and Ulf. Like, again, the first time we met Hugh this season was when he was in the throne room um, making a petition to King Aegon. And you could tell that, like, he has he knows how to address a king. He knows how to show deference. And it's not simply like a, oh, me, I'm a worm, like, step on me. But it's just like, I understand the hierarchy of things. Um, and I respect my rulers, you know, and it was weird to, right. I feel like when Ulf was first introduced, he didn't feel dis. It didn't seem to me like he was disrespectful of Rhaenyra. If anything, he was Mm -hmm. like in the tavern being like our one true queen. So to see him like finally in front of her, just with absolutely no reverence or humility. Yeah. Like I felt just as annoyed as the characters, I guess (laughs) Mm -hmm. in, in that moment. So sure. I, like, I kept I trying to I tease out, like, is this just me being annoyed, or is it like? No, right, it's, or, like, or, it's like I don't right, mind. Right. Like, lo- like I love a, a good scene of a like lowborn character bringing down a, like a highborn right. character and be like, screw yeah. you guys, you sit so large and on top, catwomaning it, like you know, just do a catwoman monologue. I'm here for it. Yes, but but it, it just From felt the Dark weirdly Rises, out. Right? Yeah, yeah, it just felt weirdly <laughs> out of character for for him, and just felt like it just did not fit where he is and what he's doing right now. Like you came to this place to get a dragon to maybe like, like improve your, your odds in this world. And it feels weird that you're now just like, yeah, screw y'all. He felt like a believable character from a different show who had yeah. been right. like placed in the room. Like it was almost weird to see him. And then like Emma Darcy's Rhaenyra, like cutting between those. Like, I'm like, these are two drastically different, like, yeah. tones happening in the same space that didn't seem like yes they seemed irritated with her there's even a moment when like you know Jay says like you forget yourself friend and you actually you, I don't know if you caught this but you can see Rhaenyra's Kingsguard like puts his hand on his sword in that moment like mm. as if Ulf is like one second away from being beheaded but like they almost didn't react enough like I wanted almost more of like a dressing <laughs> yeah. down of him than yeah. what happened. 
don't know. But sorry, I, think, I cut you off, Dave. Wait, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no worries. Uh, I, I kind of agree with Jesse. Like, I'm watching it, and the whole time, like, I'm getting annoyed. And I'm like, what is... Because, like Jesse, I'm also like... I like the scenes where the royal people are brought low. Like, I like that stuff. Why? What is it about this guy that's, like, irritating me so much? And I think part of it is what you said of, like, the character hasn't been built up like that. The other thing is also, this guy just watched, like, 50 of his relatives die. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, um, he has been shown how disposable these people are. Mm. And I guess he thinks, oh, because I can ride one, um, they can't do anything to me. But it's like, really? Like, you don't think they can just cart in another 50 of these people? And I'm just like, it just doesn't match with the situation. Yeah. Like the, his, his acting doesn't match with the situation. Yeah. Um, so... I will also confess a bit of confusion to me of like, okay, then how, like, how was he the guy sent to King's Landing in the last episode? Yeah. To like, <laughs> to, like the fact that we didn't, we didn't see his initial interaction right. with Rhaenyra that led to him riding Silverwing to King's Landing and like circling back to kind of draw Vagar out. So it, well, was, it was weird that, if like, that was an impromptu dragoning or not. That's, that's what that true. was confusing to me because yeah. I watched I wasn't here last week and I watched mm -hmm. that scene. I was like, oh, because we cut to that. I'm like, oh, did he just go to King's Landing on a mistake? And like, it, right. uh, yeah. And then it turns out to maybe have been part of the plan. It was just it was very yeah. weirdly conveyed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, get, yeah. It, I think this is a kind of a, I think that just hearing this is like it feels like the writers of the show find the cool visual or moment of like Rhaenyra looking at Aemond at the end with all of the dragons at the end of the last episode and then work backwards from right. there instead of like trying to build up to a, a good point. It just well, like, it, mm. it's same thing with the, the like big uh, montage at the end of this episode too. Well, I, I think also Jesse, what, what we're realizing is that there's a lot of stuff in the show that is just left out. And it's not, it's not like, you know, in our bonus episodes, we talk about how the show is in dialogue with the book and like, this is a deliberate yeah. change that's made from the show to the book. But there's a lot of stuff the show does that just, they don't tell you. Like, um, a son, like what did Damon say to the cheese and blood, blood and cheese? Like we just never see, um, what did, what happened after Ulf tamed the dragon last week? We just never see. And so I, I wonder it, like what the, um, I wonder if the show, I'm openly wondering if the show is trying to say something about like how we fill in those gaps ourselves. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm curious as opposed to they just like, we didn't have enough budget to film that scene. You know, I, I don't know. So anyway. Yeah. I did want to make sure that we touch upon briefly because we didn't talk about this in the Amon section, but like the fact that he burned Sharp Point and like mm, the, yeah. the relation of that place to dragonstone and the fact that like basically if you look at the map of westeros um there's like the bit there's a big bay so there's like king's landing there's a big bay and then the island of dragonstone is like out you know i i've kind of equivocated it to like long island and like new york state before but so sharp point is like at the very end of the peninsula of land that is still westeros that's closest to dragonstone so you can basically visualize on the map that aemon like flew vagar close enough to dragonstone to see those three dragons decided to turn around and just on his way back the first town that he saw he just laid to waste mm. and then like carried on to king's landing yeah. um and so, yeah, like the fact that in this episode and again, like in this scene that Rhaenyra is telling Ulf and Hugh and Adam and and Bela and Jace that like, oh, by the way, like next plan is that we're going to go to Old Town and Lannisport and basically do what Aemon just did to, to Sharp Point um, is a very like serious thing. And you see kind of like, you know, Bela and Hugh are sort of like, oh, like a lot of people you're asking us to kill and like <laughs> <laughs> again the contrast to Ulf just being like not only do I not actually care about any of this and I'm gonna be very irreverent but like also bring me more tiny birds please like right you know I'm yeah. ordering like, more just food to detonate the equivalent of a nuclear bomb mm -hmm. in like a major that... city like hey yeah. hey Ulf like can you detonate this uh, suitcase nuke in um downtown LA and he's like uh, you know who gives a shit bring me some more ale it's like yeah, it's, it's a weird it's, thing to say, Ulf. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just, like, it's like it's it's undercutting the more interesting aspect of that. Of like, I would have rather have seen like, oh, now you're these like lowborn guys are just trying to deal with your everyday problems, and now we're asking you to commit mass murder for a war right. that you don't really like. That ultimately, at the end of the day, won't really matter to your like 
if back when you were just sort of an everyday person, like you wouldn't have mattered to you either way who sat on top as long as you were getting food. And so it's just like that's an interesting aspect of yes. this of like asking the people to commit that those atrocities for them and and we don't get that. And it's more just like, ha, ah, this low born guy is kind of weird, isn't he? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why yeah. I did I loved Adam being the one to be like basically shut up man in mm -hmm. fancier words than that and then you can tell that adam is like of the new dragon riders that rainier seems to trust him yeah. the most also hugh you know despite having ripped away that food from that starving person in a few episodes <laughs> ago um he seems like he also understands the gravity the gravity of the moment right mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. and like you know and and jace points this out and B before Jace comes into the war room, the, the dialogue that you can hear between Hugh and uh, Ulf is that Hugh's saying like, hey, we're meant to be in the training yard, like learning Valyrian commands and learning how to like be with our dragons. And you can tell that Hugh is much more into like, yes, teach me. I want to be a dragon rider. Right. And Ulf is like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. This isn't that hard. I didn't have to do shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And I, again, I think we're okay with like some of that, but just like the yeah. level, it was just yeah. really I, over the top. You I know? think it's good yeah. to like show their di like each th each of the three yeah. has a different background and characterization, which I think is great to like show the different types of dragon riders. But it's just that yeah, the level of it, and also just the fact that it's it's kind of one note and sidesteps the more interesting like yeah. questions you could do. Like, what are their, each of their three reactions to like having him kill a bunch of civilians? Like maybe yeah. one, Ulf is like, I won't kill someone like me, and he was like, I'll do it for the. He honor was like, I whatever, literally you know? kill three civilians on the way here. You know? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, it's like whatever. Yeah, it's just like different different ways to play it. And so, right. yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. All right. In Harrenhal, Sir Alfred Broom arrives to check on Damon. He's the guy that Rhaenyra sent to make sure Damon's still on his uh, on her side. Mm -hmm. But instead of re delivering Rhaenyra's message, he encourages Damon to name himself king. This prompts Sir Simon Strong, who is just chilling in the Weirwood uh, tree area <laughs> in the background, to send a message to, of warning to Rhaenyra who then decides to fly to Harrenhal along with Adam. Uh, before Rhaenyra arrives, Damon is shown one more vision. This time he sees into the future, where white walkers and whites gather, and Daenerys emerges from the fire with her three baby dragons. Guys, scenes from Game of Thrones! Yeah! Look at that! In this, but not! <laughs> but not, because <laughs> but we not only really. see Daenerys from the back, so they clearly didn't get Amelia. <laughs> not only did they not get Amelia Clark, they apparently don't have image rights to Amelia Clark's face, so... Um, we just see her from the back in this one. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Which I'd say kind of like better if honestly, it's, it's honestly less distracting to me to not see Amelia Clark's face. But if I'm being frank, I thought the yeah. visual yeah. was a little bit more evocative. Yeah. I will say with the, with the leaks before I had one video served up into my TikTok for you page, I did get spoiled with just like someone describing this vision <laughs> Mm. And that was so. You, I, so someone on your for you page described the leak to you, is what you're saying? No, sorry, like text. Like it was a Reddit post. Oh, that, I see. I see that I came across and didn't keep scrolling until it was too late. <laughs> um, and and saw like I saw the words like Bran, White Walkers, Danny, and I was like, oh my god! I was like, what are they doing? And did so, they show Bran? I don't. I didn't see Bran. No, it's not Bran, but it's the Three Eyed Raven who mm. is like Bran becomes the Three Eyed Raven. That would have been funny if they ended with Bran, because <laughs> they're like they, even the even this show doesn't want to remind you how Game of Thrones ended. No, it that should have been how it ended. Was Bran on the throne? That's mm. that should have been what Damon's last mm. vision was. Yeah, but it wasn't. No, nope. the show is like don't want to go there. Don't want to go nope. there. <laughs> uh yeah so i i was kind of braced for seeing like amelia clark as danny mm. and then i was like oh no they're doing a more like abstract thing and even like i paused it on that flash of like a white walker in the whites and i'm pretty sure that that is not an actual scene that we saw in game of thrones like the whole face yeah. structure of that particular white walker was not recognizable to me as someone who has taken many screenshots of every white walker we saw <laughs> Throughout Game of Thrones, Kim Kim Renfro has measured these White Walker skulls <laughs> with calipers, <laughs> like, and that's like how that, she knows about the face bone. structure. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but got, but folks, you know, this is a Daenerys ex machina here because what happens <laughs> is Damon wakes up and he has found God. He's seen the future and he's like, "Hey, oh, I I shouldn't have tried to betray Rhaenyra. I should I should just do what I'm supposed to do." And that's it. So the whole season was just a big misunderstanding, folks. <laughs> that's kind of where that all wraps up, I think, right? So Rhaenyra yeah. comes to confront him. 
and then he bends the knee and says uh, that she is their queen, and together they must follow this path of fate. Uh, I, you know, I do want to mention before we get to it, there is this cool moment where Damon's vision ends, and it seems like. Helena is in the vision, and then it's actually like you think that it's Helena in the vision. It, it cuts to Helena's face. You think that it's actually still in the vision, but it's actually Helena in King's Landing in real life. And I mm-hmm. thought that was a really cool moment of like playing with reality and the dream state in the show. So, right. Like she yeah. is somehow tapping into his vision that's being given to him by the Weirwood tree. And, and again, like we see this character, Blood Raven, like the three eyed raven who. Bran meets back in Game of Thrones and the the implication to me almost seems that like the three-eyed raven is helping control what imagery is getting like funneled to Damon in this mm. moment almost um and then it's like okay so then how is Helena who's not like anywhere near a weirwood tree or like a godswood like she is somehow like tapping into that vision that Damon's having and seems conscious of it and she's speaking to him and that that's like the final note of it. Very interesting linkage of like all the sort of magical aspects of the yeah. story here. Yeah. So that was cool. Uh, but anyway, Rhaenyra comes to confront him. I have to say the scene like outside the castle also looks super cool. Like the, mm. the castle just Very as much, a yeah. visual, it's just like this massive kind of staircase or whatever. This like a uh, massive hill, the green hill that leads up to the castle is cool. The, you know, Anytime it shows people in relationship to the size of the dragon looks amazing. And Rhaenyra goes to confront him. And um, there's a big um, tense moment when you don't know what he's going to do. And she kind of calls him out. She says, hey, so, and and who are you sworn to? You know, and I like how she steps back and like yeah, says it to the whole. Says it out loud to, to everyone. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was a wonderful moment. And you kind of wonder what he's going to do. And it's like, oh, folks, false, false alarm. False alarm. He wasn't actually going to betray her. Just he just had a little dalliance with it. That's all it was. Um, yeah, I mean that's and that's the Damon storyline of the season, folks. Uh, Jesse, go ahead. I will say I actually really liked this. I, I so few things of this. I really, I always get worried with prophecies and like metatextual stuff of like, oh, we have a prophecy that connects to like the other story because we're a prequel, and it's just it, it ends up often. I feel like having TV shows or stories sort of like conform to always explaining what the other story is. So if you have a prequel show, it's like, oh, well, look at this thing. It explains how that character got his gun or how this character met this character. Like it's it always sort of like conforms that in this way. However, what I liked about how they use the prophecy and the metatextual stuff in this episode where like literally they say to Damon, like, it's all just a story and you you have a part to play. Like, that's literally saying, like, you're part of this grand story, the metatextual aspect of it. But it links to Damon's own sense of guilt that we've been seeing all this season with his own prophecy of like how all the flashbacks that we've been seeing this season, which I have granted, like paced very terribly, but have all been about how he has regretted his constant uh, striving for for ambition and how it's like pushed everyone away in his life, like Rhaenyra, his brother. Like it's it's it, it, you just constantly get in these evocations of guilt and what it's led him to do and the horrible things that he's done in the name of it. And he's kind of had to confront that these past few episodes to the point where he's just like, I need to give that up and actually just serve somebody. And so in a weird way, like as much as I've had issues with the pacing of the season and Damon's story throughout this whole season so far, I actually really feel like they did the prophecy stuff well and made it feel earned in a way that actually related to Damon's character. It wasn't just sort of like, Ooh, look, here's some game of Thrones stuff that we're going to throw at you. Isn't that cool? It actually did feel like an emotionally resonant arc for Damon and, and actually humbled him. And, and so it paid off, this scene actually worked very well for me for that payoff. So, yeah, I love the way that Matt Smith delivered the line again. And, and also like the contrast of how they speak in Valyrian in mm-hmm. front of people when they want to like have a private conversation, but not, but where, when she says, you know, like leave me again at your peril. And he says, I could not, I have tried. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that that was both funny and also like, yeah, like I think mm-hmm. that Damon learned that like, even when he tries to, to, veer away from Rhaenyra and their path like he was literally going insane is is, is Mm -hmm. kind of like the feeling that I got like he he eventually learned that like he will be haunted literally if he tries to leave her side and so the fact that he's now like not not simply resigned to to being 
her second in command, but like that he will now be robustly behind her. Um, I appreciate. I also love, I, I feel like I was Simon in the background, like that little like happy clap, like, oh, this is all over. And yay, <laughs> yay. yay, Rhaenyra, she is our queen. <laughs> like, I don't have to deal with this guy anymore and his <laughs> weird stuff. Uh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, I actually also really like this whole scene. I think mm-hmm. I am a fan of the destination and not necessarily of the journey on this one. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. I like where it ended up. Like, the sequence is great, tense well staged well choreographed and so on Mm -hmm. um the moment when like all the people will start bowing to her is very moving um but i just think the damon stuff this season has been pretty rough for me as a non-book reader and Mm -hmm. you know maybe even the book reading is from what i can tell is not super relevant to whether you like the damon stuff Um, so it just has been pretty rough for me as a show watcher uh but loved where it ended up like great Mm -hmm. great no complaints about the Rhaenyra Damon stuff in this episode and how it plays out. Just the ju- this journey here. I'm like, I, I wonder if uh, th- that was the best path to take. Yeah. So. Also, the fact that the scene takes place in the same room, like this is the hall and the location right. where Viserys was named next king. Like this is where they opened the vote box yeah. in the in the whole prologue section of the show. So really poetic in that sense. Also, I don't know if people clocked that Alfred Broom. Mr. Turd Cloak himself did not applaud and cheer for for Rhaenyra's reaffirmed status as queen, but slunk away into the crowd. So. Well, I think he's probably uh, what you would describe as proper fucked at this point. <laughs> <laughs> is my guess because he has betrayed. He's already was annoying Rhaenyra, and then like Damon recognized that he is a turn cloak. And mm-hmm. so it's like, he's now out of favor with both of these characters. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't see a good future for that guy. He so. Homer Simpson into he's the like, bush. Yeah. Of... Going back. Peace. <laughs> yeah. There's a brief scene of Rhaenyra and Missaria talking again about what kind of ruler she'll be. Um, we, you know, all the scenes are like really beautiful because it's, it's clear they're actually standing. Uh, mm. From what I can tell, they're actually standing on location in front of this big body of water and it looks amazing. They really um, got two dragons to fly yeah, around. Yeah, they really got two dragons yeah, to fly around in the background. That was amazing as well. But I just wanted to acknowledge that because obviously their making out was a big moment a couple episodes ago. Um, but now that Damon's back in the picture, uh, well, unclear. We, yeah. I, I don't think you talked about, I don't know if you talked about it last week, but there was um like uh, news that came out that apparently the kiss was improvised between the actors. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. means to me that like there was never going to be any textual bringing up of it again because that was an improvised moment, right? Because if the act, if the episodes were written and then they improvised it, like maybe they would have added something in the text of it, but like I potentially not. So it was it it was weird to me that that they kept it in the show without any chance on desiring to following up on it at least this season. Maybe they'll make it more overt next season, but yeah, it was just it was a weird. As much as I liked that sequence in that moment, yeah. it was a weird thing to leave in if you weren't going to do anything with it. And it was so just an accord- uh, Reading here from Collider, in an effort to avoid feeling queer baby, uh, per, uh, per Mizuno, who plays Masaria, the script actually called for the two to simply hug and share a breath. But the intense emotional vulnerability of the hug naturally morphed into what played out in the final cut of the episode. Um, so, But I, I thought I also saw... Sonoya Mizuno in a different interview say that like there was something made clear to her about her like that those two characters would have some sort of more than friendship relationship at some point in the show so like the like the like the episode as written didn't include a kiss but that like overall there is still something intentional going on between those two characters even if it wasn't written to become explicit in that episode Maybe I I hope so I hope so because yeah it just it, 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 it the queer baby part of it it's like it, it feels it feels like there's an element of it there and again I don't I'm not gonna fault anyone of it and, and it's one of those like it just it just more feels weird to not follow up on it in this season and yeah hopefully yeah. we get it in season three yeah uh, I agree th- th- have a moment be like that was a mistake let's not do that again yeah you know? like or, some, or whatever something yeah. <laughs> some some or you and I can yeah. you and I can still like do stuff even while Damon's here <laughs> like we'll figure yeah. it out like something yeah 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 all right before we talk about the kind of climactic moments of this episode uh, I just want to take a moment to. First of all, uh, thank both of my co-hosts for doing the podcast this season. Um, you know, the podcast 
exists and comes together because first a you, people are funding it at decodingtv.com and b because uh, my co-host agreed to do it i want to say a big thank you to uh, jesse this season because um, she signed on to help out and provide stability to the podcast at a really critical time um, and so we're really grateful and i've really appreciated jesse's contributions and of course all the amazing notes uh, and commentary and book comparisons you hear each week uh, Kim prepares these like really immaculate show notes uh, that I read from and it provides like just a lot of insight and she's doing it often with a baby in her lap, you know, or against her chest. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet the notes are still uh, excellent each week. And so I want to say a big thank you to uh, both Jesse and Kim for doing the show this season and for the amazing job you both did crushing it. Um, really appreciate it. And I know... Many of our listeners have written in saying, you know, this show is the favorite part of their weekly routine. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been just wonderful to, to have it be going on this season as well. So thank you both. And until next week's episode that we're going <laughs> to do with bonus, um, Jesse Earl, you want to let people know where they can find more of your work on the internet this week? Yeah, well, I do want to say just thank you right back at you. It's been an honor to be part of this. And I was glad that you asked me to do this. And I, I enjoyed listening to you both last season. So it was really cool to join you both for this season. And I hope we get to do it again. And yeah, so just thank you very, very much. Yeah, um, a pleasure, Jesse. Yeah. And as for my stuff, you can find my aforementioned film that David said at the top, uh, Identities over on Nebula, the streaming service. Uh, support me over there. Um, and, uh, you can also follow my work at Jesse gender on YouTube. It's where my video essay style stuff is over there. So you just type in Jesse gender and you'll find me. Also, I, I saw your, uh, movie identity is getting a Blu-ray release. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They just announced that <sighs> the other day. I'm yeah. very excited That's about amazing. that. So, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. getting a copy. So yeah. You know. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, nice. be sure to be sure to support Jesse's movie identities. Uh, which stars Abigail Thorne. Yeah. Star of this episode of, uh, House of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and of course, Kim Renfro, where can people have more of your work on the internet? Uh, more of my musings on the world of Westeros are in a book that I wrote and was published a few years ago, The Unofficial Guide to Game of Thrones. You can buy that at any of your local bookstores or go to the library. Check it out there. Support local libraries and buy physical media. Heck yeah. Buy the Blu-ray of Identities. Yes. Love Support that. Support physical media. All <laughs> of it. Support that for sure. And yeah, also just, yeah, big, big thank you to you both because certainly as Dave just said, like... I I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesse stepping up to to support and make it possible for for me to do this and have a newborn baby and all the chaos of that. Um, and yeah, it, you're just both the best, and it's it's been a huge honor to me to to step into this show starting last season, and I'm really happy that that we get to continue it here. It's a great great part of my week every week, and I'm it's really cool that we get to share that with so many other people who watch this show and just love discussing it. So yeah, yeah, thank you for listening to all you out there too. Absolutely. I also want to say if you enjoy this podcast, check out the Decoding TV flagship podcast at uh, decodingtv.com/podcast or wherever your podcasts are downloaded. We review basically a new show every week. We've been covering shows like Presumed Innocent and uh, The Acolyte, The Bear, and a bunch of other stuff that's come out this summer. Um, so check it out at uh, decodingtv.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, that show is running year round. All right. Let's get to the climactic moments of this episode. Allison had already seemed inclined to leave her dowager queen life behind. But after seeing Eamon's actions, she is spurred into the rash approach of sneaking to Dragonstone to help appeal for Rhaenyra's help. I'm going to pause here for a moment and say that uh, I think I expected that Rhaenyra and Allison would meet again after like we saw them like in episode three of this season. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it would happen so soon. And yeah. honestly, I'm a little concerned that it happened so soon because it makes it feel like it's kind of not meaningful for them to meet. Like last time it was like a heist to get her in there. Yeah. Right. This, this one, she just kind of shows up. She's like, oh, hey, I'm here. Hey, cool. Hello. It's cool. It's like, okay, really? Right. Um, there because... was all this buildup to like the Eric, Eric how will you ever possibly get in there? And then it was like Alicent in the middle I, of the night well, and her, I, I think her it King's should guard. Be, it should be difficult. Like it should yeah. be difficult for these characters to actually talk with each other. So like the idea that she just kind of pops in on a whim. Um, I don't, I don't love that concept. Uh, and I know for a fact that all this is show invention. So, uh, <laughs> so it's like, 
you know, maybe the show took a few more, a few too many liberties here. Um, you know, uh, the other thing I'll mention is people got some different vibes off of last week's episode. I think like I saw some, some speculation that, uh, Allison was thinking of, uh, self-harming last episode. Did any of you see that? Mm. Like that, that was like that, that she was contemplating, uh, suicide in last episode. I, I'm I curious. saw jokes being made about it. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't know if it was jokes or actual analysis. Maybe it was it, not actual analysis. Maybe it is also actual analysis. I thought I saw like an interview of her saying like that's what she was thinking at the time. Okay, um, I could see it. But I, maybe, it's not what I immediately thought of. But just having you say that, I'm like, I could see that. Yeah. 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 The jokes I saw about it were like because also we always record these before there we've seen a right. and the preview for next week or whatever so like the episode where rhaenyra and masaria kissed then the preview showed like allison walking into a lake and i saw a bunch of people being yeah. like allison hears that rhaenyra kissed another girl and just uh, can't, just can't bear to live any any longer we're like cause, and the vibes were a little bit like what is she doing there but then actually seeing the scene within the context of the episode i was not getting the vibe that like she was there out of some sort of self harm inclination more like unmoored and yeah as she describes here trying to just walk around in the world and figure out who the heck she was um but i also you know that's a valid interpretation like suicidal ideation can look a myriad of different ways from the outside so like it is certainly possible that her character was at that dark dark point as well in, in time reading from time.com olivia cook gave an interview about that episode i'll just read here just so we know what her perspective is quote allison needs to get out of king's landing to figure out the longevity of her house family and herself the longevity of her life her daughter's life and how sustainable it is at this point she needs to be able to plot without Eamon looming and without being used as a chess piece she's gone off to try and make all these humongous decisions that will impact the regency possibly forever allison saying i'm not yet certain i do when asked if she returns to the city, is actually her saying, I don't know what will be in my future after the course of what I'm about to do. Um, I always came at the narrative as a point of Allison's liberation. She's not useful to Eamon or Egon anymore, so she can move within the shadows because she's not being monitored 24-7, end quote. I think that that was what the line that sent a lot of people was like, people ask if she's going back to the city, and she's like, I'm not certain yet, mm. you know, if I'm going to. And, and that's, I think, what people were, were reading. Um, but yes, Based on the events of this episode, it now seems very clear she's just thinking. She's just thinking of her thoughts, trying to figure out what was going to happen. Uh, and so she g goes to think her thoughts, and she decides she's going to appear in Dragonstone, ask Rhaenyra for help, uh, to help her escape, her and Helena escape the obligation of ruling, and say that she will open the gates and surrender King's Landing uh, uh, during a time when Aegon and Aemond are out of, out of town. Mm -hmm. uh, when Rhaenyra points out that claiming her throne will mean she has to kill Aegon, Alicent tearfully accepts this truth. Okay. Huge. I, I know none of you saw this coming because it wasn't in the book. <laughs> no. So Kim Renfro, what would you think of this scene? I, like Rhaenyra, was surprised to <laughs> have a middle-of-the-night <laughs> appearance from Alicent in in her chambers um, or in her library. You know, it seems like that's, that's the same location that they went to. Uh, I, I do similar to like the sept scene. I was kind of thinking as it was happening, like, huh, I wonder how divisive this will be among book readers in particular. But I, f I really feel like I could watch Emma Darcy and Olivia cook as Rainier and Allison talk forever like the more scenes between them the better kind of in my opinion and i think that this one laid out so many interesting aspects of their background um where they are now this like intimacy that they have where it really feels like you know they know each other in a very unique way and and to see them be able to kind of spar in that way and then move back into like okay let's actually just like talk about what needs to happen now the fact that like in theory, these are like two of the biggest enemies in the realm, but when they're actually in the room with one another without the eyes of anybody else, they don't mean each other harm whatsoever. Like they really do seem to have this bond. Um, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. Again, I, I loved the scene and then was sort of like, huh, like interesting that this is like the big moment of the finale. 
obviously a like huge uh a huge piece on the chessboard being moved here in the way that Allison lays out this plan and and Rainier seems to accept it um also a surprise to me as a book reader this is yeah, not she how... is going to betray Egon her son right that is yeah that her is whole the plan. family effectively yeah, her whole family yeah. yeah except Helena who you could argue is not involved in right. this in the same way that that the rest of her family is yeah what I really uh liked about this is yeah I, I think the dynamic between the two actors is great and it's kind of a similar thing to the Damon stuff I actually like that we got this scene not sure about the path to get there but like to see these actors bouncing off each other is wonderful uh I what I really appreciate it is like them acknowledging their t- they they have two very different positions as it relates to the throne like mm-hmm. for Allison it's like she actually says like hey come run away with me she pulls a Laris leg on situation she's like hey come on escape with me we can do this it's and, Rainicent is the <laughs> yeah and Rhaenyra <laughs> says you know you, th- this may be optional for you but like it's not for me like I, I have to do this I have to stay and see this through and uh, that's when it really crystallizes the difference between these two characters and I thought that was a very beautiful moment mm-hmm. um, so I like that a lot uh, also, yeah, like there, you know, we had talked about how Allison might realize, Hey, um, uh, maybe I was wrong about that whole prophecy thing. And it, it seems clear, like she did really come to that conclusion here. Um, so that's kind of a payoff for that plot line that, that, uh, came into play. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention before I want to, I want to hear what Jesse have to say about this, but like, uh, I think Rhaenyra doesn't know that Allison is sleeping with Kristen, right? Like. Yeah, so she doesn't know that's the lover that yeah, is up- like, alluded to. It's like, hmm, it's I have to say, good thing Allison t- left out that critical piece of information because that <laughs> yeah. might have uh, might have influenced uh, Rhaenyra's willingness to go along with this cockamamie idea, you know? Um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that her response as it stands was great of being like, oh, ho, ho, like who has a lover it's you like i loved that like that really you don't think if it's like hey i'm fucking your ex like that's i yeah, don't think rainier gonna... sees kristen as her ex i don't think she cares <laughs> like she'd probably be like well good for you i guess yeah Sitting with that asshole it's fine i yeah i don't know that it would have like pissed her off i mm. think that she probably would have found it even more like salacious mm-hmm. on allison's behalf mm-hmm. or maybe would have been like oh of course that's who it is but like yeah. not a like oh i'm i'm so mad at you for having like no i don't, yeah, think, I don't think she, she get feel- jealous of Kristen. i don't think anyone's gonna be jealous of Kristen. And if, i did wow. like the line where she says yes but you alone made virtue your banner like yeah. that whole like bit of like uh like the back and forth between the two of them i thought yeah. that worked out really well Right. Uh, with, the, with that element but, of it. Like, like Jesse, basically yeah, calling yeah. her out on the hypocrisy that we've mm-hmm. been discussing. Right. Yeah. Of of team of the yeah. yeah exactly. Jesse, uh, your thoughts on this critical climactic scene of the episode. I mean, you both said come some of the main points. One thing I would also point out too, uh, again, just as a book reader, we all know that Allison isn't as big of a force in in the books. And so like this scene doesn't happen. And like, again, I won't spoil where things go, but this gives a lot more agency to Allison within the context of the story. So it's just an interesting thing, again, putting in that context of this being in a conversation with the historical text of the book of like a lot of what women do behind the scenes is often uh not noted upon um and it's often reframed in history to give it to the men and even it, that's actually brought up in the sequence toward the end here where like history will paint you a, paint you a villain i think uh rainiera says uh, um you know uh and so it's just like this discussion of like yeah she will be seen as a villain the way she's been treated uh throughout uh you know the past few episodes will be completely erased and she'll just be sort of seen as like oh an evil woman manipulating things um when there's far far from the truth and again it just goes to the patriarchal great man of history's way that we tell history i just thought that was a really interesting aspect of all this also just the um I mean, everything that you sort of pointed out to just the, the sapphic vibes of here of like a love that never actually happened. Um, there, there's just like a tragedy in a lot of their lines here that I, I kept hearing come up of like, if we weren't having to deal with all of this bullshit, 
we could have uh, we could have had something here and like the lines of like how they ended up having to go back and forth with each other there was that other line that said uh you know yes but you alone made virtue your banner and i clung to it in defiance of you i think who so disdained it mm -hmm. so again that sort of like back and forth reaction to each other so yeah mm -hmm. I, I think uh I, I think this is an amazing scene yeah i agree with you david didn't earn it to get there but it was really really great overall so yeah i, I don't know about earning it it's it's less about earning it in this situation and more like um it just seems way too easy for these two to visit each other yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like oh, i'll pop over oh, and talk oh, to oh, my oh. biggest enemy it's fine oh, you know? oh, oh, oh. Yeah. there's such a build-up to the first time they right did it. and then and then literally zero build-up for this one right she's just kind of like it's kind of like a mini version of that whole thing <laughs> of game of thrones where it's like oh it takes a whole season for us to cross like a little bit of land and then next season we just zip around wherever right. like that yeah, same yeah, thing. kind yeah. of yeah right because like i believed that damon knew how to sneak into king's landing and then it was very uh, like it made a ton of sense that like Missaria then understood how Damon did it and could replicate that passage for her. Allison's having to go to Maester Orwell and be like, I need passage. And then we just, she's just there. And so like, <laughs> yeah. we have, like we're having to assume that Orwell has access to all the same secret dalliances right. that Missaria does, which is a little bit of a stretch within yeah. the universe. And it's like, like uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, like this is, you should be doing this all, you should literally be doing this all the time then. You know, like, yeah. if, if this is how easy it is. You should literally be communicating all the time because I think this would save a lot of lives yeah. and a lot of trouble. Um, the moment when she says history will paint you a villain, that was interesting to me because uh, it, it felt almost like fourth wall breaking. Like this is mm -hmm. based off a history book and like FY in the book, you're going to end up like looking pretty bad, but just, you know, I know that mm -hmm. that's not how it really went down. And as a, as a show watcher only, I'm wondering, does history paint her as a villain? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. But I'm really curious, you know? So it's a, They did a similar thing in season one with Viserys where he asked, I believe it was when um, Lionel Strong was his hand and he asked like, how how will I be remembered? Like, how will the history books paint mm. me, I wonder? And I remember being like, well, we know. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> um, and how? what was the answer to that question, by the way? Good, like, right? Positively. In, yeah, like mostly like, oh yeah, he kept the peace and like he was a good king and eh, yeah. and like good but forgettable king. Yeah. Good yeah, but forgettable. He was but... the Joe Biden of kings. <laughs> <laughs> Not inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. I like so much good writing in this scene as well when when Rhaenyra sort of like blames Allison for everything that's happened and Allison is like hey like that's not fair you know like don't you don't you know that like Aegon would have been crowned anyways if I hadn't done anything and Rhaenyra's response of did not your hand bring it forth like a midwife was like I was like oh like yeah like that is like it's such a good analogy for what happened effectively it was that like yeah it would have happened anyways but like Allison made the process so much smoother um like a midwife birthing a baby uh so yeah just love that scene exactly what you both were talking about of like the exchange about um sort of how history might see everybody also the fact like um Rhaenyra <laughs> the little like you're much changed to Allison I was like <laughs> are you like hitting on her in the middle of this conference like it was like just like a and then Allison's like can we can we not right now like let's <laughs> look, this, look I've kissed another lady inside this room before <laughs> so like you know I'm feeling pretty pretty uh confident here yeah. mm, it was so good um yeah just just a, a really beautiful scene I think and when I realized that like the the dramatic exit of Alicent was like the big epic moment that we were leaving on. I was like, okay, like, you know, I started getting into it a little bit, whereas I had been a little more mystified for, for the earlier parts of the season. Although again, it was like, it was like that really, I really got cemented in the idea of like, oh, they're not giving us any action. Right. Quote unquote. This episode. This finale, which not to say that you have to have action in, a finale to make it like good and satisfying and exciting but to loop all the way back to like what jesse was saying at the, the top of our discussion as a book reader i had a couple big set piece quote unquote uh storylines from fire and blood in mind for what i thought might happen um and then they didn't That's, this that, season that 
to be fair, we're like even even more on that, like seemed to be set up at the finale of last episode, like the end of last episode seemed to set up like, right. yeah, there's going to be a big action thing happening. And then we don't get that. And especially as a book reader, you like these things are on the horizon that that could be setting up and we mm-hmm. don't get that. And you're sort of like, oh, oh, OK. It just was it was a weird it was just a weird structural thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh. Um, it also makes me wonder why they were so protected. Honestly, when yeah, I finished right? watching it, I was like, why did they care if this leaked or not? Like, and not, not obviously shouldn't leak, but like, um, why were they going to withhold this from critics? Uh, critics right. Yeah. It's like, right? it's like, there's nothing that's in it. That's like, oh, wow. I can't, I guess the Allison Rainier are meeting again, but they already did that earlier this season. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. And again, <laughs> before I knew that they didn't use Amelia Clark's face and I just yeah. read that description from the leak, I was like, oh, that like i get i i thought right. being you want protective to of like yeah. amelia clark's coming right. back as daenerys for like a freaking vision like whoa but then it, it that would be legitimately big news her. Or, yeah, but, yeah. yeah all right so the episode concludes with an epic montage of allison leaving dragonstone while the respective armies prepare for confrontation the starks cross at the twins while the high towers march with dayron flying his dragon to Sarian overhead there's a shot of Otto in what looks like a prison cell of some yeah. kind yeah, that yeah, also that was, surprised that was weird. me. That was weird, yeah. And that was, once again, like, <laughs> another piece of this episode where I'm like, there's so much happening and yet not enough of it, of, like, <laughs> these pieces of story that we were getting. So, yeah, they're they're implying, I believe, that Otto has been in prison, but then the whole shot is that he's, like, you know, squinting his eyes at, like, a torch approaching him. So we're supposed to, like, assume that someone's coming to his cell for some reason, but it's like, we didn't even know that he was in jail, let alone. Yeah. My, okay, my vibe from that was that he was in some kind of carriage of some kind. Well, yeah, because they cut immediately to after that, it was then Laris and Aegon in the carriage too. I'm like, oh, is he in the yeah. carriage with them? And then he wasn't. And I was like, what? what is what is but, happening? But I felt like he was in a moving vehicle. That was kind of the sense yeah. I really? got from that shot. Yeah. No, I actually, that's, uh, that's for some yeah. reason I, I did too. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, cause it doesn't look like, cause just the way the camera is moving, it feels like we're meant to, it's meant to evoke a moving vehicle. So yeah. okay. like, wasn't he like supposed to like, um, last year, Laris's back last yeah. action was like, he was supposed to go make sure Otto got there. Okay. Right. Like that's, yeah. And then, then we weren't sure about the status of him. But, right. Yeah. Laris had been ordered to summon him to King's Landing to once again serve as the hand. And then in that same episode, we hear from Allison that he has not been responding to her letters. Right. And everyone she asks doesn't really have a clear answer. They're just like, oh, he's probably fine. And now we're like, yeah. okay, Random. he's not he's not fine. Again, as a book reader, that was a bit of mystifying to me, yeah. I will say. It was, just, it was very, regardless of what they intended with that shot, it, it, it's very... <laughs> unclear what's happening and honestly would have been best to just not include it. I think they just, again, they wanted like, well, we have to have auto in here somewhere. Yeah. yeah I, I agree that that is kind of, the, that's the vibes. It feels mm-hmm. like it's like, well, we got to get, we got to get so-and-so, you know, like it just, yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Damon overlooks the gathered River- Riverlands army and the new dragon riders suit up for battle. Reyna comes face to face with a dragon at last and Alan and Corliss approach their warship. Uh, the final shots set up a parallel between Rhaenyra standing in her Targaryen stronghold and Alicent watching the sunrise over the sea. Uh, I do appreciate that the the score is pretty great here. In particular, like oh, yeah. I, the, I love the uh, when we saw the Starks, you hear the Stark theme kind of mm-hmm. play a little bit in the background. That was kind of and cool. the Lannister theme. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. During the Lannister army march. Yeah, incredible score moment. I mean, Ramin Jawadi is like an absolute icon when it comes to this franchise in particular, his work yeah. in general across everything that he does is really excellent. And yeah, this was another, this was a really good musical moment I thought in the show. And it like a big credit to him, like often the music in the show does a ton of like the lift for me emotionally of like feeling really invested in what's happening and getting excited or getting, um, yeah, eager to see what happens next or feeling emotional at the sign of something exactly like the Stark army. Like it absolutely still does something to your blood to hear that theme and see, you know, the, the Stark sigil, the dire wolf sigil and uh, like, yeah, huge, huge credit to him. Incredible talent. All right. I I mean, at the end of the episode, I'm feeling to myself, Oh man, I can't wait for all these people to fight. But that's literally exactly how I felt at the end of last episode. So it's like, okay, I don't know that that much progress was made here. 
Um, but yeah, we, we are going to do a bonus episode next week to talk about like stuff we didn't fig- talk about this episode. A cast of kings at gmail.com. We want to have your emails, your questions, your thoughts. We'll talk about those next week. But until then, basically like closing thoughts for the season. Overall, I think started super, super strong for me. Um, got a little bit waffly at the end here, but still overall good. And like, I still am feeling a really deep appreciation for the way that uh, this team is adapting George's George R. R. Martin's fire and blood. Um, I think that the, the way that what we see take place on screen and like the depth that we're getting from this main cast of characters uh, remains incredible and awesome and great performances. I think it's some of the smaller characters that were a little less successful overall in the season when I sort of look at the way that they were introduced and the way that we landed with a couple of them here. Um, but I think we're set up for a pretty great season three. I'm just now, now I'm I'm like, all right, I think I know what's going to happen next season, but clearly I can be very wrong sometimes. So, you know, keep keeping me on my toes here, Ryan Gondal and Sarah Hess. Thank you. Jesse Roll, any reaction to this season of television as a whole? Yeah, this season very much felt like a setup season to me. Like it was it was a bridging the stuff from season one into season two. It didn't have as strong a into season three, I think you Sorry, mean, season right? three, excuse me, yeah. what I meant. Thank you. Um it didn't have as strong a voice, I think, as season one had, where it was very clear where we were building to, and you could sense that like tension and dread that we're going throughout all of season one leading to the king's death and everything that fell out afterwards. This season didn't have that, and as a result, I think a lot of it uh, I really did enjoy. I think it's a generally very strong season, but I also think that it uh, struggles with some pacing issues where it's like trying to have big, like trying to figure out where the big moments are, and sometimes they succeed, like with episode four, and sometimes they don't really nail it, like with the finale here or with, um, uh, I think, of the the twins, sort of that whole, like, sneaking in and everything so it it feels like this was just sort of like oh we're setting up for the big war that's going to be coming really in season three this is sort of the bridge between those two elements of like people trying to avoid it and how it escalates and how it just really spirals um and as a result they're just trying to figure out stuff that fits in that void and some of it works some of it doesn't and ultimately it it leaves it pacing wise a bit uneven but overall i still think a really solid season yeah when I think about this season of House of the Dragon compared to last season, overall, I- I'm quite favorable on it. I think one of the big things uh, that this season has going for it is no time jumps. And mm-hmm. I know that I harped mm-hmm. upon that a lot last season, but like, hey, we got to see a story un- unfold very organically. Uh, what's great about this season also, like some of the, the two-hander shots or two-hander scenes where you have like two great actors bouncing off each other, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Allison and Rhaenyra, uh, Rhaenyra and Damon, you know, th- those kinds of scenes, just like really great. Uh, Oscar Tully and Damon, you know, like all, all that stuff is like mm-hmm. really, really great stuff. Um, I think one of the biggest disappointments of this season is just separating Rhaenyra and Damon. Like, that's just a huge bummer to me. I know, mm-hmm. like, you can't change the storyline that George laid out, but it's like that dynamic was such a critical part of season one that that made me enjoy season one. And like, it's just gone this season because they spend. 80% of the season apart from each other. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, and then, uh, you know, season one had a really incredible ending, right? I just thought, I still remember the shot of how season one ended, even though I saw it years ago. Uh, and this season ending is not as good. <laughs> like it is, it is barely what I would describe as an ending. You know, it, it feels like we are leaving the story midway arbitrarily as opposed to um, like, oh, wow, that's a one unit of, se- like this season is a, a complete unit with its with an intact arc that feels cohesive and organic. Um, that is not how this season feels. It feels like we just randomly departed the story at a, a point in time. Um, and so that is also not great. So overall, still very favorable, favorable thoughts. I think like um, highlights of the season, episode four, the Rook's Rest episode, episode seven, the dragon taming episode, like wonderful television. So like just some of the best stuff that you can see on TV, production values through the roof, et cetera. Um, but I'm left feeling very odd about the season because mm-hmm. this is just a weird ending, you know? Yeah. Weird place to end mm-hmm. it. So. Very huh. Very yep. huh. huh. Very huh. 
Very hard. <laughs> hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.